think it's okay. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much for that great introduction. Um, yeah, I'm uh, from the BGS. If you don't know the British Geological Survey, it's about 700 people, quite a big institute, with the biggest geological institute in the UK. And um, there are about 500 scientists and technologists, and I'm the Director of Science and Technology, so I look after those 500 science and technologists, and I set the science strategy for the organisation. So one of the things that we're going to do uh, in the next few years is spend quite a lot of money in the developing world. Um, we've always worked in the developing world a lot. We've probably worked in every, virtually every country in the world uh, through our 180-year history. But uh, in the next few years, we'll be particularly spending quite a lot of time. And what I hope to do is to show you some of the things that we've been thinking of, some of the sort of horizon scanning aspects of geological work in developing countries. So um, it's quite a complicated and long title, but I hope that you'll sort of get the understand it as I move through. So those of you who don't know the Nexus, it's a very simple thing to, to uh, illustrate. You know, you have a in 2030, for example, lots of increase in demand for energy. We've got lots of increase in food required by 2030, and the same thing with water. 30% extra by 2030, 50% extra by 2030 energy, and 50% extra food by 2030. All these are estimates from various institutes. And this system here shows how complicated it is. The trouble is, if you want these things, they all depend on each other. And if you want to generate energy, you need water. If you want to uh, grow food, you need water. Uh, and you can see that complexity there. It causes a lot of tensions between those areas. And one of our problems in the future will be how do we live in a world where we have to satisfy all those three things. When we have climate change and a fast growing population and also a lot of people moving into cities. So that's what I'm going to be looking at today. Here are the vague, um, the sort of main areas that I'm going to be discussing in the next sort of 45 minutes. So, the use of geological fossil fuel resources. And this is a, a rather scary prospect, which I will hopefully explain my thinking on. And also, geology to protect against climate change, and very much the opposite side of that. And then, perhaps something looking to the future, into the 2050s, 60s, and 70s. 50 or 60 years beyond now, what will geology help us to do in planning for these tensions, in planning for this nexus which is appearing, particularly in the developing world? So just to quickly explain um, some of the simple tensions that you have in East Africa, for example. 90% of subsistence agriculture is rain-fed, vulnerability of soil increases with climate change, We've got 286 million people in 2012, 800 million by 2060, a billion, over a billion by 2090. So how are you going to look after those people? How are you going to provide them with food? How are you going to provide them with water? And how are you going to provide them with energy? So that's just a, a scene set. In fact, Colin, um, I'm quite right about where I spent a lot of time. I spent 10 years here in Botswana as a school teacher in a very small rural village. So I did experience some of the difficulties of living in a developing country and some of the wonderful uh, things that you can also experience. So first of all, let's look at use of geological fossil fuel resources. So um, I'm kind of addicted to this book. <laughs> I'm coming out of explaining and telling you now. This is a really interesting book that's published every year. It's the World Energy Outlook, and it's produced by the IEA, the uh, Energy Agency. And it's a, an organisation which seeks to understand energy demand and energy and how it's going to be satisfied into the future. It's a great book to read if you're interested in what's going to happen in the future in, in regards to energy. And this is a, just one chart that they took out of the out of the book, which um, helps you to see the changing geography of world energy demand. You can see here the dates, and you can see energy demand, demand by different areas. This is the new policy scenario. So there are three scenarios that the IEA use to predict energy demand and energy supply into the future. The new policy scenario is essentially the middle one, which is 
most enlightened one, if you like. Uh, there's also a business as usual one, which is you know, assuming that we don't apply lots of checks and balances and controls on emissions. So this talk, well, the first part of the talk, will be based around the new policy scenarios. It's a, it's a scenario that essentially tries to predict um, energy demand and supply under uh, a reasonable number of emissions, policy emissions, that, to, sorry, policies to uh, suppress emissions. So the first thing to look at is the energy, increase in energy demand between now and 2040. You can see that essentially North America, European Union, is either flat or it's declining. But the scary parts are Africa, India, and China, where you have 30% of this increase in world energy demand in Asia and Africa. And of course, that's fairly expected in the sense that these are growing economies. You would expect them to demand more energy, particularly as people demand, you know, if you like, a more energy-intensive lifestyle, cars, and bigger houses, and whatever. So it's, it's something you might expect, but it is quite concerning in the sense that this a large increase is accounted for by the developing world. And here is an interesting set of diagrams also from the IEA World Energy Outlook, which shows uh, energy mix, global energy mix for 2014 and for 2040. What you can see straight away is the energy demand overall is much larger. So you're looking at 17, I think, terra, uh, what sure of that, unit. But I think it's terawatts actually, 17 or 17,866, and you're looking at 2014, a much lower figure. So that's obviously something you'd expect. But what you notice is the mix between now and 2040, according to the IEA, doesn't change very much. That's pretty scary. You see, coal is still there. In fact, all three of the major fossil fuels, according to the IEA, increase. They don't increase percentage-wise, but they increase uh, in, in an objective way, in the sense that in 2040 we're using more coal, more gas, and more oil. You see, renewables certainly increases, and renewables becomes a greater percentage of that whole. But the scary thing is there isn't much change between now and 2040. There's a big increase in renewables, but all the main fossil fuels do not decline. They increase. And if you look at other forecasts, for example, the EIA, uh, the Energy Administration, so the Energy Information Administration of the United States, and the B and BP, for example, and other organizations that produce forecasts, they forecast similar things. They don't forecast a decline in fossil fuels, they start forecast an increase, but probably a percentage decline. That's pretty scary. Again, from the World Energy Outlook in 2016, Focusing on coal alone, this is the most worrying one. What you can see is a changing geography in coal demand. This is where the coal is going to be used. In Africa, Southeast Asia, and India. We're going to have a decline in coal use in China, the United States, European, and Japan and Korea. So we have a shift, if you like, of coal usage, which is surely the you know, the least thing that we want being used to generate electricity, certainly, is actually increasing in, in Africa, Southeast Asia, and India. And again, you see the same uh, essential forecasts from BP and the EIA as well as the IEA. Uh, it continues. Uh, this is slightly older statistics, so this is from the IEA World Energy Out 2011. This is just looking at India for an example. So, in India is a big developing country more than a billion people. You have uh, coal demand in India by sector in the new policy scenario. Again, I'm sticking to that conservative scenario. So you have what will, uh, how will coal be used, essentially? What you notice straight away between 2000 and 2035 is a forecast. There's an increase in the amount of uh, coal being used to generate power. You have industry, other new sectors, and buildings as well. So countries like India are forecast to use more coal. They have a lot of coal. India is very rich in coal. And it, at least IEA, it's rather an old prediction, but it at least suggests quite a large amount of, of that coal will be used for power generation. That's an interesting point. Sorry for all these graphs, one graph after another. 
Um, why might developing countries like India want to use fossil fuels? I mean, we don't really want to use them for obvious reasons. Why is it in India and China and South Africa and uh, in, uh, Indonesia that they might want to use these sort of fossil fuels? Well, this is a nice diagram from a, a paper by Hagers, 2012, which shows the use of um, how much people use um, traditional biomass, whether it's wood or dung or whatever, to, uh, for energy, domestic energy. And you see that India uses a huge amount of uh, essentially traditional biomass, um, something like uh, this figure here, very large numbers of people. Similarly, in sub Saharan Africa and China, Latin America too, large numbers of people use. Uh, biomass for cooking and heating in, in particularly rural areas, uh, as you can see for India. Um, and in parts of India, certainly if you talk, if you visit India, uh, the idea of um, rural electrification is very much related to uh, poverty alleviation and improved health. One of the problems in India has very high levels of respiratory diseases, for example, for using biomass for heating and cooking in houses, for example. Uh, it's really uh, uh, you know, terrible for people's health. So, you know, in parts of India, electrification is a really important way in which people believe that uh, less biomass could be used. And India is a third of the world's poor. You know, 100 million people still use firewood to cook food. Rural industry and irrigation would be something as well that the India, Indian government would like to um, encourage. So that's one of the reasons why rural electrification is so attractive in India. And that it can be done off-grid with solar, for example, but um, in many ways, the larger requirements of rural industry and irrigation need something bigger. So where is this electricity going to come from? Well, in India, it could come from coal. And you know, they've got a lot of coal. They have ultra mega power stations which are being built all over India. As you can imagine, ultra mega means they're pretty big. These are four, five, six gigawatt power stations, so bigger than, than we have in the UK. So then, either Indian coal or imported coal. So it's a, a fairly scary prospect um, the fact that you know, developing countries like India are considering the burning of coal. So the question is really, will developing countries use fossil fuels? This is an interesting survey of where fossil fuels are in the developing world and across the world generally. It's quite difficult to get data like this. But essentially, again, it's the IEA data. This shows oil, gas, and coal, so the three main fossil fuels. And it shows essentially production, <coughs> reserves, recoverable resources, um, and other recoverable resources for oil, gas, and coal. So don't spend too much time looking at this, but essentially what you have is, for example, in Africa, quite large amounts of oil. In, uh, in gas, Africa, not so good on gas, but Africa is an underexplored region, and companies are always looking for places to explore oil and gas. Coal, Africa, quite large, mostly South African coal, Indonesia you can see, and Asia generally, very, very large on coal. So one thing you can be sure of, there is a lot of fossil fuel in the developing world. And the question is, are they going to burn it? Because if they do, we're in trouble. So what I thought would be interesting is to look at energy transitions. To look at how societies change from one essential energy source to another. And all societies, all countries have gone through this. And it's a very interesting historical perspective to look at how energy transitions occur. So here are some conceptual ways of looking at energy transitions. So these are the ways in which societies switch from one bulk energy source to another. This is perhaps the easiest to understand. This is from a very recent paper by Sobotor, which shows essentially the percentage of total global supply going back a long way to 1830. What you can see straight away is wood or biomass being absolutely important in the 
years before the Industrial Revolution. And you have it being completely dominant. And then you have coal in theory, and rising up in this inevitable rise related to the Industrial Revolution, which I'm going to talk about in more detail in a minute. And then you have others rising in waves. For example, natural gas, and you have uh, renewables, and you have nuclear as well. And essentially, societies, countries, move through these stages at different times. The United Kingdom was one of the earliest, in fact, it was the earliest, to transition from wood to coal. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So this is an important diagram. What I'm going to do is look at how transitions occur, because maybe it can help us to understand the transition that might happen in developing countries, which we're just looking at right now, we're on the cusp of. And here's another interesting diagram, which is in a different way. So it sees it as a ternary system with zero carbon, coal, and oil and gas. And that pathway there is essentially the same pathway that you see here. And move up to high levels of coal usage, and then move down towards oil and gas, and then to zero carbon. It's interesting, this paper is actually about the hydrogen economy, so it looks at how hydrogen might take over. That's another story, it's a fantastic story, but unfortunately we're going to leave it at that point there, about 1970. That's another way of looking at these energy transitions. So let's think about Britain for a bit. So the UK, we had already moved from a wood society, if you like, to a coal society by 1700. It's really incredible that we did it so long ago. We were using coal from the eastern parts of England, we were moving it down the eastern coast of the UK to London and to, uh, to Humberside. We were already using more wood, sorry, coal in our houses and in cooking and in industry than we were wood in 1700. A few essentially became independent of wood because of this stuff, coal. This is a picture from the window of my house when I lived in Botswana. I didn't live in a rondeville like this, uh, but I, I, well, first when I arrived I lived in a rondeville like for about, uh, about three weeks and it's pretty difficult because scorpion used to fall from the thatch into the, into the room, which is not very really nice. But they are, they are quite cosy houses because they're, they're cool in the summer and warm in the winter. That was the house I could see from my window when I looked out. I lived there for 10 years. And these houses are completely dependent on the local environment. So the grass is gathered from about 10 kilometers away. This wood is chopped from nearby. And these are ladies collecting wood that they burn in these houses. And this is more or less the same. I haven't been back. It's 15 years since I left Botswana. But, um, people that have been there recently say that still most people live in rural areas like this. And essentially what you're looking at in a place like Botswana is a wood economy up to a point, certainly in rural areas. That transition hasn't been made. Yeah. So how, do, how did the wood to coal energy transition take place? How did it happen? This is very interesting because uh, Sobakul looks at it from the point of view of core countries, rim countries, and periphery countries. So there's a, a primary early adopter of this wood to coal transition of technology, and that was India. And there's a rim developer, so people that take up the technology but do it later. And then the periphery, so these are countries that take up much later. And of course, this is absolutely intrinsically linked to the Industrial Revolution because that started in the UK, started in England, or in, in, in the UK. So, what you essentially get is a period of extended uh, experimentation, in this case with coal, a small scale technology, a diversity of design. Then you get a scale up of uh, designs to improve the economies of scale. Then as the industry structure becomes standardised and markets become saturate, saturated, you get further industry growth by globalisation, diffusion of successful design. I'm going to talk about this in a minute and show you how it happened. Essentially what we're talking about is the growth of cotton mills, mostly in the Industrial Revolution in the UK, and other things as well. And then a, a shift from uh, the core to the rim to the periphery markets, so coal spread across Europe. So in England it began, the midpoint was in 1736. The diffusion took 160 years so across the whole area. In Germany, 1857, you can see how that coal 
development spread across Europe. Quite interesting how, how many years later it took for other countries in Europe, in Europe to develop this. If you're interested in energy transitions, there's one happening right now uh, in a smaller scale, that's shale gas. So those of you who are interested in shale gas, it started in the United States, it's developed very rapidly, partly from the Barnett Shale in Texas. It's a gas that's being used extensively to generate electricity in the United States. And uh, it developed improvements of technology of hydraulic fracturing in Texas. And the globalization stage is starting. It's beginning in, in, in China. So China's developing hydraulic fracturing. And Argentina have already got, got it going in Canada as well. It may happen in the United Kingdom as well. We have three drilling sites here in the UK. Um, but essentially, this is what happens in energy transitions. So let's look at the British energy transition. This is really fascinating. So I really recommend this wonderful book by Andreas Mann. It's a wonderful mixture of technology and history and Marxism. So it, I'm, I'm not a, a Marxist, but it's a very interesting read because essentially what he does is he connects little old Britain with the invention of what he calls the fossil economy, the invention of capitalism as well, because you can't have an extensive fossil economy without being able to move money around in large amounts. So he blames some pretty nasty things on us British people. But essentially, his thesis is that about uh, early 18th century, what happened was we began to develop factories. This is one of the earliest factories in the world, Cromford Mill in Derbyshire. We made cotton there. And that was actually using water. So it was using the power of water. And Britain made a lot of money making cotton in that way. But not long after doing this, those very entrepreneurial capitalists that developed the Industrial Revolution looked around and thought, you know what, this water is a pain because we can't get the gradient we need in many places. In Manchester, they filled up the number of places where there was enough fall in the water, enough gradient in order to generate enough power to, to, to do this column. And they said, there must be another way of doing it. And sure enough, what came along was the steam engine. And the steam engine essentially made it possible to make cotton, to do cotton, all over the world, wherever you have coal. And what Andreas Malm says is that was a massive change in Earth history, in human history, because suddenly we were no longer bound by our environment, our immediate environment. In other words, the fact that water falls down a gradient. We were bound by the energy and something which comes from under the ground. In other words, from coal that was generated in the Carboniferous period, some of that 300 million years. 330, 340 million years ago. Suddenly we switched from a, a society that depended on the natural environment to one that depended on something that we dig up. And that is a massive change in Earth history. It's a fascinating story. And what he, he describes is, for example, the original purpose of coal, heat the populace over the whole way to population concentrations, which lured manufacturers away from water as a source of mechanical energy. Coal and stoves which was a pattern centralized set settlements. Water mills came as a contradiction with this pattern. The conversion of steam resolved it by bringing capital and labor together. All about capitalism. And cities too. This is where cities came from. So he not only blames capitalism and uh, global warming on us, but he also blames cities on us. Very interesting a thesis. I recommend the book. And of course, during those years of steam, it was enormously Celebrated. This is a paper, uh, painting, a painting by Joseph Turner. Who, I'm sure you've seen this wonderful picture. It's a celebration of steam and power and energy. Um, and you can read in the Industry of Nations, for example, in this book published in 1855, steam was a moral force for good. The steam engine, consequently, as a slave of man, is a machine which is most highly valued and which, under a skillful direction, has accomplished more than any other machine the promotion of the comfort, convenience, and well being of mankind. Wow. Steam is wonderful, and coal is a wonderful thing. But look at this. So, this is a great 
slide, a great picture from a book which I also read by David Mackay, Sanjay Lai, a few years ago, who was chief uh, scientific advisor to DEC, as, as it was. It's a wonderful graph showing CO2 concentrations over the last thousand years, partly from ice and partly from direct measurements of the atmosphere. So this is the, uh, not the hockey stick, but the CO2 hockey stick, if you like. What you can see is 1769, which is where steam came online, essentially, where Watt and others knew kind of developed the ability to generate power. That's where it starts kicking off. So it might be that it's a wonderful force for good, but it's also the point where the atmosphere started to register what we were doing to it. That's an interesting sort of uh, dichotomy there. And of course, this has led to an interesting discussion of something called the Anthropocene, which you may have heard of. It's the, the latest geological epoch. The so Holocene will be followed by the Anthropocene. So, I think the big question is what will the energy transition be like in the developing world? Are we expecting a similar rerun of the Industrial Revolution? Of course, it's not going to be cotton or anything, but is it going to be something similar? What's going to happen in the developing world? Because it's important. If that happened when we ran the Industrial Revolution in Europe and in North America, if the developing world does it again, we are in trouble. That's the second time I've said that. So does it have to be like this? Does the developing world transition, energy transition, have to look like that? So there's an interesting work being done by, uh, for example, IRENA, uh, International Renewable Energy Association, Energy Rock, uh, Agency, and by uh, People Power Planet Group, which is uh, uh, published a recent report. There's a nice little article in Nature about this about uh, three months ago. What the Africa Progress Panel, which is full of huge luminaries, including Bob Geldof and <coughs> others, uh, thought was it doesn't have to be like that. Africa did an amazing thing in the last 30 years. It jumped from having essentially no telephone system. I know because we didn't have a telephone for 10 years. It was wonderful, in fact, not having a telephone for 10 years. You couldn't get a landline where we lived. But within 20 years, mobile phones completely took over. They didn't have a landline system. They didn't have one of these funny phones that you do that with. They went straight from no phones to mobile phones. And this is an idea that's been peddled by the um, Africa Progress Panel. Could Africa jump, leapfrog fossil fuels straight to renewables without having to go through all this? That's the question I'm kind of repeating, I guess. Can it leapfrog to full renewables? So this is... Um, Data that was gathered by IREA, it's published in a short article in Nature, 2016. It shows the potential for wind and solar across various parts of Africa. Wind, solar, it doesn't show geothermal, unfortunately. And we do need to do that one as well. So you can see the potential for solar and wind, at least according to IREA, far exceeds the estimates of demand for electricity in 2030. Think back to those IEA forecasts where we were looking at enormous increases in demand across Africa. So wind, solar, geothermal. Uh, can these renewables in Africa be realised? That's the question. So the question I put at the bottom is intermittency, which anybody who studies energy knows quite a lot about because the good things about renewables are, of course, that we get the energy essentially free, but the bad thing is that it doesn't always, it's not always there for obvious reasons. Um, there was an interesting point, I think in May, uh, sorry, April last year, where Germany, for the first time in its history, generated 100% of its energy from renewables. One day, I think last year, somebody in the audience may be able to correct me, but certainly one day, Germany generated all of its electricity from Next day, it was burning lignite, which is not very good because the sun got in and put it crudely. So it is quite difficult to balance complex energy requirements, and intermittency is a big deal. So 
Just talking about Germany, Germany's very forward thinking about energy. And one report that I really recommend is a report produced by the German Academy of Sciences. It was published last year. And it's a forward look to 2050. How will Germany generate its electricity? I'm just moving back to the developed world for a minute, but you'll see why I'm going to do it in a second. So these are essentially different scenarios for generating power by 2050. And we have a scenario here. This is a minus 80% emission scenario, so minus 80% CO2 emissions, so a greenhouse gas emissions. 90%, 50%, 90%, 50%, 90%, 100, 100. So how does Germany think it can achieve all that electricity without, with, with such a large emissions reduction? Well, basically, from solar and wind. So Germany believes that solar and wind will be enough, but crucially, it needs lots of gas power stations to power up when there's not enough power on the grid. So this is quite a common idea, this idea of load following. So gas power stations are extremely quick to build, they're quite cheap, and they can be switched on and they can operate and produce you know, enough power when the sun goes in to cover the system. And this is not an unusual plan. It's already been done quite a bit in Texas. Texas, for example, is a big wind it produces a lot of energy from wind. It has a lot of gas power stations. The gas power stations are essentially there to, to sort of fill in for the renewable, the load following. And so Germany thinks that that's one of the solutions. Intermittency, fix that by, by using gas to fill in. Gas is relatively low uh, carbon emissions compared to coal, it's about half as much as coal. Perhaps that could be an African solution. So could African uh, grids or African power systems produce um, or burn gas at times when there's difficulties. There's also load following with, hi following with hydrogen. So this is a really interesting area which I don't have time to go into in detail. But essentially, um, there are people that are suggesting that if you take the methane, that's a natural gas essentially, you can take out hydrogen from the methane using a steam reformer and you can bury, you put the hyd hydrogen in a salt cavern underneath the power station and bring it up and burn it, coal fire it with methane. And we have much lower emissions because hydrogen obviously doesn't produce any emissions, it produces more methane. So this is another area too that Africa might take up. One way of dealing with intensity. Perhaps the best way of dealing with it is to have a big grid. And this is something that Europe particularly is interested in developing. Surely Africa there's a situation where at least somewhere there's enough wind and enough sun to generate enough electricity for everybody, putting it crudely. If you have a big enough grid that covers a big enough geographical area, then those intermittency problems can be ironed out. So a really big continent-wide grid. We already have a big grid in, in Europe, but the grid doesn't connect very well. In some parts it, it, it connects okay, but in other parts not so well. So one of the easiest ways to fix European intensity would be to have a better grid. And that's what the European Union is particularly looking into. But here in Africa, what we need to do is build a grid suitable for renewable intermittency. This is the present grid, which you can see is incredibly sparse compared with, for example, a European or American grid. We've got huge areas that simply don't, don't have mains electricity. So what that really means is an enormous investment. If you want to build a grid that's capable of dealing with that amount of intermittency, you have to really uh, expend some money. So, essentially, Sub Saharan Africa's renewable power needs will cost 40 billion a year. This is from um, IRENA, 6.35% of Africa's GDP. If we want to do this big leapfrog, then it's going to cost a lot of money. Locations of wind and solar are not known enough to, to attract private investment. Although we've got this data here, we don't really know precisely where the economically favourable areas where you can actually do it in a site-specific way. There's not much known about exactly where wind and solar would work. The same with geothermal. We know that East Africa is very good for geothermal, but where it work, would work best is, is something we don't know. So this early work to develop the the feasibility, if you like, hasn't been done. And also, Africa already lacks a big electricity grid. So building one big enough to deal with intermittency would be an enormous undertaking. 
But it's there, it's a, maybe a possibility. But just talking pessimistically, what if these fossil fuels were to be taken up by developing countries? So India, uh, Indonesia, South Africa, really starting to take these, they already do back in South Africa, but in other parts of East Africa. What would happen? Well, we have the Paris Agreement where we have the, uh, keep, so we keep global wind service standards as well, we have 2 3 c we're trying to get an increase to 1.5, we look at the net zero emissions in the second half of the century. If you look through the IEA work and the EIA work as well, it's quite difficult to see what the scenario where a large take-up of developing country fossil fuels would take us in terms of these. But it's certainly not a very good story. It, it's very difficult to see these things being satisfied if the developing world takes fossil fuels in a big way. And it's also quite hard for us morally, it's a strange thing to use a word like that in a talk like this, but essentially we can't go around telling people not to use fossil fuels because that's how we got rich because we use them and if you look at where our big cities are they all sit on fossil fuels mostly and who's responsible for the act what's in the atmosphere already this is a great chart from the paper, uh, book by Mackay which shows who's responsible for that CO2 it's us and the USA and Germany we put most of it in the atmosphere and we got rich doing it. It's going to sound pretty bad us telling other people not to use their fossil fuels. And most of it is from coal and hydrocarbons. So, I'll kind of come back to that in a minute, but that's a slightly pessimistic view of geological resources and fossil fuels and what that means for climate change. Let's look at the other side of the coin. So, geology to protect against climate change. So, water and groundwater, first of all. So, uh, a very interesting World Bank report, published recently in 2016, it's called High and Dry, I recommend it, looked at the impacts of climate change, and they considered that essentially most of the impacts of climate change would be filtered or channeled through the water cycle. So, the systems of food, energy, urban and rural life will be mostly affected when climate change happens through water. So it's an important thing to focus on how the developing world will get water. Um, slowly spiraling in on the food, water, energy, electricity. It's also highly political. So this is a great map that shows, from the same report, that shows where the large catchments of the world are. And many of them are in developing countries. The world's largest river catchments are in developing countries. And most of them, most of those catchments are multinational in the sense that the catchments are not in one country. And that, of course, means that it's highly political. Because when you start messing about with someone's water upstream in another country, then the country downstream is going to get upset about it. So it becomes a political problem too. So water and groundwater is a scientific and technological problem, and it's also a political problem. Let's look at some of the scary modelling that's been done just for runoff in East Africa. So rainfall and runoff in East Africa. This is a great summary paper that was published last year. It takes some of these large catchments in East Africa, and the Pogo, the Zambezi, and other river catchments in East Africa. And it looks at papers and studies that have tried to model the effects of climate change. So we take a few, let's take for example the Nipopo. So this is the river. Well, I used to go down to and I lived in Botswana. I used to go down to the Botswana uh, because it's a big house, but I used to take a boat out of it. You can see the effects that uh, you could have. Minus 21 to minus 34 percent change in runoff. The Nipopo basin, the Lopo Popo catchment, is a hugely important catchment. Millions of people have lived in it, and it Essentially, he's looking from this study here, it could be uh, completely wrong. The study is essentially looking at huge changes in runoff. What does that mean to the sustainability of agriculture, to lives and livelihoods of the people that live there? It looks catastrophic, really, because you know, the people are living in pretty difficult stress circumstances as it is. You take 20% of their water away, then it really becomes difficult. 
So this is really a big problem. But in fact, groundwater sort of comes to the rescue to some extent. Because we all know what groundwater is. It's the stuff that sits below the water table. It's the stuff that sits there because it pours in from rocks and pours in from rainfall and collects in the subsurface. It's very widespread and it occurs in large volumes. It's a buffer against seasonal variations. Already, groundwater is used a lot in Africa because essentially when you've got a dry season and a wet season, it doesn't really matter because the groundwater doesn't move up and down very much. It's kind of buffered from those changes. Aquifers lose nothing through evaporation or transpiration, virtually nothing. And what that means is that, you know, in some parts of Africa, for example, 80% of rural water supply and 60% of agriculture and irrigation in India depend on groundwater. Groundwater is incredibly important. It's also really good with climate change because it seems to be less affected, or at least that's the theory. We've looked at here at catastrophic changes in runoff, but in groundwater, those buffering effects mean that groundwater is essentially more reliable in the long term. So, groundwater is important for Africa, for climate change. But what do we know about it in detail? And what happens to groundwater and climate change in detail in the local areas? What can we do to help people plan? So there's not much published about African groundwater, certainly at the local level. These are papers uh, by my colleague Alan McDonald, who's a BGS geologist who's worked on groundwater in Africa for many, many years. He published this great paper which shows uh, for the first time, in fact, uh, estimates of groundwater amounts across Africa, and also by country. So it shows the amounts of groundwater storage across Africa. It comes up with a huge figure, 0.66 of a, a million cubic kilometres, so two-thirds, um, um, 0.66 million cubic, so two-thirds of a million cubic kilometres. Cubic kilometre. So, you know, quite a lot. And this shows you the amounts here in the subsurface. This shows a slightly more subtle uh, uh, measure of aquifer productivity, so how much the aquifers could actually produce. So we have different levels here. Put it um, crudely, what their estimate were was that well constructed walls would be okay for low intensity rural activities, so low intensity irrigation or, or human systems, essentially. But for industry and regular irrigation, or big irrigation, the potential for high irrigation waterfalls is much more limited. These are the first estimates from the, the continent wide. You can see East Africa here is not amongst the high yielding aquifer areas. So there are many, many questions here. How much of the runoff deficit that I've described can be compensated for by groundwater? We don't really know. There are some estimates locally, but um, not the whole area. Are the aquifers large enough? Will recharge in the area maintain the sustainability of the aquifer? Will you know, aquifers are not sustainable if you simply abstract water and break away from the recharge, and then we get mining the water. So will recharge work in climate change? We simply don't know. What will climate change do to African groundwater? In general, it's not really understood. Alan McDonald and his colleagues are starting to work on that, and it's being recognised as an absolutely vital scientific question for the future of Africa. But at the moment, we don't really know in much detail. Let's look at the UK. You might think the United Kingdom would know a bit more. But in fact, we don't know that much. In the UK, also, there are very large areas where groundwater is really important. The south of England, for example, not up here in North Wales, but in parts of England, groundwater is incredibly important for us, for farming, for example. This is a very interesting piece of work done on historical groundwater. So it was work done again by my colleagues in BGS, Bloomfield and March. And they looked at seven uh, wells, um, water wells across England, and they looked at historical records. One thing about British people is they love making records, and we do have fantastic records going back a very long time. So we can actually plot the level of groundwater, the water table level in these uh, wells. And these black areas are essentially groundwater droughts. So areas where at times when the groundwater level went down and caused problems. And you can see that they have a sort of, sort of regularity about them. They probably are amenable to statistics. 
And some statistics have been done on these. These are the biggest records that we've got. What they've also tried to do is to look at El Nino and other bigger climate changes going on and try to correlate you know, in a simple way any of these changes. And it's very difficult to do that. They haven't really succeeded so far. They have done some basic statistics under a 2050s high greenhouse gas emission scenario. And what they come out with is reduction in annual and average summer groundwater levels, I suppose that might be obvious, and increase in average winter groundwater levels. But this is in a country with an enormous amount of data. I mean, we are very sophisticated in our data. In Africa, it's a, a very different story. So another uncertainty is, what we're really trying to do here is to understand the developing country problems in this nexus, which I've approached from two angles so far, from energy and water, not actually going to do food. Um, we're going to try and understand what we're going to, what, what, from what we know about them now. In fact, what we really need to do is start looking at, at Africa 2030, 2040, 2050. What we really need to know is where are all the people going to be in 2040 and 2050 in Africa? Where are they going to be? And where is the tension? Where is the nexus going to be the most difficult to resolve? Where is it going to be hardest to solve the problem that everybody needs water, power, and food all at the same time? So this is an interesting one. Again, you can look back in history and maybe learn something a little bit. So this is the Zambian copper belt, a um, very famous area. In the 1920s, if you'd visited that northern part of Zambia, it was essentially savanna and woodland. There was nothing much there. But within a few decades, it turned from being essentially rural into containing some of the largest towns in Zambia, they contained 2 million people and 15% of its population. And that was because of copper. This is a pattern that's happened all over Africa time and time again. And is there something we can do to look at how new, new people, new industries, new towns and cities will be? Where will the new copper belts be? They don't have to be related to minerals. It could be related to other things, other sorts of resources. But where are they going to be? So can we think about that? One of the things that you get if you read about the copper belt is a pretty terrible legacy of environmental problems and degradation related to mining. There's something the Guardian recently, there's what you know, some of these big copper smelters look like. You've got enormous amounts of land degradation, eutrophication of uh, waterway pollution, runoff and leakage from waste dumps, tainting dams, lead contamination sources. What can we learn from places like the copper belt? Well, and where will this nexus be most intense? Well, this is quite interesting. So there's all sorts of work going on, and have been, has been for quite a while, in engineering departments, civil engineering departments across the world, certainly in South Africa, looking at how developments move across Africa. And what these essentially are called the development corridors. It's a great map showing where development corridors have moved across Africa, mostly related to uh, natural sources, including uh, minerals, or oil and gas, and whatever, but moving across Africa and developing. And there are areas where um, politicians, for example, economists, industrious, industrialists, are looking to establish development corridors and build on the ones that already exist, but actually develop them even better in a sustainable way. So patterns of potential resources like land, water, and minerals might help us to understand where future development might be and where the nexus might become really, really difficult because everybody needs water and everybody needs energy. So we can look at existing infrastructure and transport and we can look at these development corridors. This is actually Lake Victoria. This is one called the Northern Corridor, looping around the north of Lake Victoria. It's kind of in development, but certainly the Kenyan authorities, for example, are very keen on developing this because it's about poverty alleviation and development of industry and, and what have you. I mean, these development corridors eventually become transport corridors. They become logistic corridors and economic corridors. So these are the ways in which Places like Africa develop. And 
essentially much of the impetus is geological because it's resource based, it may be groundwater based or minerals based. It may be minerals that we don't even know we need. You know, we're used to thinking about copper and platinum and things. But what about these metals and the elements that go into mobile phones and go into solar panels and go into electric cars? Rare earth elements, for example. Where are they in Africa? And where will they start to be mined? Where will the development pressures be? And how can we make those mining activities more sustainable so that they don't make a horrible mess like Zambia Cotterbell did? So, uh, I'm just going to round up a little bit by looking at nexus and climate. And this is an interesting, I think, an interesting comparison. So I've tried to show you how essentially science links with history in the sense that we can learn from the way we've done things in the past, development corridors, the coal to the wood to coal transition, and other transitions that have happened in the past. We're used to, as scientists, and I'm certainly used to this, because I've worked on sort of paleoclimates in the past, as was mentioned by colleague. I've done climate feedbacks and tipping points. And we, many of you in the room, I'm sure, are you know, very aware of these, the idea that climate can be driven, or climate change can be driven by positive feedback loops that work in the same direction as the original change. And there's warming, causing more warming. A tipping point, a revolutionary change, is a point where a climate system changes from one stability to another stability. And these can be kind of nicely illustrated in conceptual ways, which you look at them and you think, well, that sort of explains it, but then you see there's something wrong with the diagram. But essentially, you have things like um, positive feedback, you know, propelling the Earth up to a point where it tips over into another sort of existence. So the idea if you go from a stable system to another system is non-linear. This is the idea of tipping point. This is another conceptual way of looking at it. This is stable in the sense that there's a certain amount of, if you think of a ball in moving up and down, there's a certain amount of change which is accommodated by the Earth's systems. And there's a point where you drive it over there and it flips to another system. And that's a tipping point. These are interesting climate models that ice albedo effects. So you can melt the ice, the albedo changes, so you get more warming, so more ice melts. So you get this positive feedback loop, which is why the North, the North Pole, for example, is warming faster than the area. Methane hydro release is another one. You melt methane hydro to produce methane, to methane that warms the earth, so you get more methane hydro release. Blah, blah, blah. So I think we're all familiar with this kind of interesting way of looking at climate change. But in fact, our energy transitions are exactly the same. But they're kind of economic, tradition, sorry, economic industrial things. So essentially, what we're sitting in, what we looked at when we moved from wood to coal in the UK, is a sort of tipping point. And I think Andreas Mal really nicely put that. He showed us that suddenly we moved from being a society that no longer relied on the natural environment and switched in almost an imperceptible way to something which enabled us to generate much more power, almost unlimited power, from carbon that was 330 million years old. And in fact, there are numerous examples of one system switching to another. You could regard switching from coal to oil, which essentially happened, not completely, but it happened around 1860, 1870, uh, and the turn of the century in the United States. Um, and these are essentially systems going from, well, um, systems changing from one to another, with their own internal uh, kind of equilibrium. equilibrium. And you've got feedbacks and you've got serendipity as well. Let me try and persuade you a little bit more. So we take wood to coal, the steam energy, what that enabled was people could use steam to mine deeper because you could get a coal that was not previously gettable because it was flooded with water. The steam energy pumped the water out of the mine. So it meant you could mine even more efficiently. The more coal, the more steam, so you could mine more coal. And it was just a positive feedback. The same thing with, for example, steel. So Jim producing lots of steel. It's not that well known, but the railways that we developed in the UK to move coal around rely on steel. Because there's nothing strong enough except for steel for the rails. And of course, steel was a natural 
product of the industrial revolution. Without it, it wouldn't have gone so fast as a positive feedback. More obscurely, things like sulfuric acid couldn't be made in large amounts in the industrial revolution before the industrial revolution because you couldn't smelt enough lead in order to make the vessels to contain sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid was used, for example, to, to bleach cotton and a whole load of other industrial things. Basically, they're all positive feedbacks working to make the industrial revolution go faster. Interesting enough, there are lots of other serendipities. So one thing that's very interesting if you look back into history. Pennsylvania, particularly Pittsburgh, became the biggest steel making area in the world in the 1860s and 1870s. And they were using coal to smelt the steel. And there were loads of complaints about it because the air in Pittsburgh was so thick you couldn't breathe it. And weirdly enough, in about the 1870s and 1880s, they switched to gas because gas was locally available. Amongst the first gas wells were drilled in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were actually drilling for water, but get this pesky gas tank coming out. And nobody knew what to do with it. And then suddenly they realised what they could do with it. And they cleaned up the air in Pittsburgh. So it's all been done. Interestingly enough, oil, when it was first produced in Pennsylvania, they didn't know what to do with it. Because mostly lighting in people's houses was whale oil. But there was a short period of time when whale oil was difficult to get. And suddenly someone worked out a way to refine that oil that was coming out of those wells. And suddenly a market was created for fossil fuel oil, which hadn't existed before. And then a few decades later, along came Henry Ford, who said, I've got a really good use for that oil. And there was lots of shipping as well. And so suddenly you have this enormous, serendipitous push that developed oil. It wouldn't have happened, perhaps it wouldn't have happened to such an extent. So I think it's an interesting way of looking at you know, energy. It's, it's, it's similar. You know, I feel sure that. Historians see it like this, but I'm sure that scientists often don't look at this as a similar system of, of serendipitous feedback loops and big changes. So conclusions. Well, developing worlds in, 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 in an industry, so in an energy transition, there's no doubt about it. It may affect whether we stay within the 2D of what the developing world does. We don't really know what it's going to do. The developing world needs groundwater to buffer climate change, but we need to understand its capacity and limits. That's a very geological question that we need to really work on right now. Geological resources may help to predict patterns of growth and future intense nexus problems. We're looking at the development of coronavirus, for example. And these energy transitions that I've tried to show you are societal, they're technological, they're economic, but they're very much similar to climate change techniques. And I think it's worth thinking about them as similar systems. Of course, what this really means is. The problems we've got are highly interdisciplinary. You know, these are problems of history and problems of social science. And I think scientists who claim to study climate change have got to start talking to social scientists because otherwise we're not going to solve the problem. It's an obvious thing to say, but I think my presentation particularly highlights that. And finally, so here's a good question. Have we really made the energy transition? The age of steam? You know, that started in the 17th or mid, middle part of the 18th century with these cotton mills. Have we switched? Have we gone, have gone through the tipping point? Are we beyond the age of steam? No. That's a steam engine. It's a power station, a coal power station. Most of our power in the world is still generated in coal and oil power stations. We still generate most of our electricity, at least, through steam. I don't think we've jumped into the next one yet. We're still in the age of Thanks to James Watt. Okay, that's it. Thank you.